Hello there, here with a review of a Paul McCartney album. It's been a while, I think. It was last December, I think, when I last did a Paul album. Uh, this one, from 2005, Chaos of Creation in Backyard. So, um, this one is from 2005, like I say, and it's held in very high esteem, this album. Uh, Chaos and Creation in the Backyard. Yeah, when a lot of people rank Paul McCartney albums, this one tends to come very near the top. Uh, and... I can see why it's a wonderful album, as I shall go into more depth from here. Anyway, this is the one and only copy I own of this album, just the 2018 pressing. That's the front cover, and that's the back cover. And within it, you get a random picture of sketches. That was the download card that fell on the floor. Uh, download card is there, I'll put that away later. I'll put it all away later. And then the record you have a sketch of Paul, which I'm not sure if Paul himself did, I can't remember. Uh, in fact, I think it says on the back. Uh, no, it wasn't, it was by Brian Clark who did this drawing. And then you've got the lyrics and the personnel, I think. Yeah, personnel, which is all cool to have. Record, it's just on black vinyl, so I won't bother getting it out. Um, like I say, this is a 2018 pressing. I think originals were a gatefold. I've got a funny feeling those sketches down there might have been what the gatefold was. Anyway, um, put that on there. Like I said, just just a 2018 pressing. When it got re-released, original copies of this cost ridiculous amounts of money. Because uh, it came out at that time when vinyl almost ceased to exist. But then it made its comeback later in the noughties, early 2010s, whatever. Anyway, this album, Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, this album is one of Paul's most highly esteemed albums. And yeah, like I said earlier, if you ask Paul McCartney fans to rank albums, this one tends to come near the top. And there's a number of reasons for this. It's very personal. You don't get that very often from Paul. Paul tends to write more about like characters or songs that anyone can relate to. This is one of the few occasions where they're very personal to him. And so, some people have called this uh, album Paul's Plastic Ono Band. I wouldn't go that far. I don't think it's quite to the extreme levels John went to with Plastic Ono Band. But it's definitely about as personal as Paul has ever gotten. Anyway, uh, I have my iPad here of things. I've got all this to talk about, you lucky devils. Um, so anyway, this album it was released on the 12th of September 2005. And in my opinion, and I think an opinion of quite a lot of people, this was where a great streak of albums began for Paul, uh, which is going on to this day. Everything he has released since this album has been a good album. Great albums, even. Uh, it followed on from 2001's Driving Rain, a very, I was going to say divisive album. I don't know, is it divisive or is it just general consensus? Is it Paul McCartney's worst album that I'll press to play? Tends to be what people would rank as Paul's worst. This followed on from that, so it's like a complete 180 from that. Um, you go from one of his worst albums to one of his best. Uh, but I haven't reviewed Driving Rain yet, so I'll save my thoughts on that for another day. Anyway, this album was recorded from September 2003 until April 2005. And it was recorded at Rack and Air Studios in London, as well as Ocean Way in LA. So when it came to the producing and the production of this album... Paul was speaking with George Martin, and he suggested to Paul that he works with a chap called Ni Nigel Godrich, um, who obviously did go on to produce this album. Now, Nigel Godrich has previously produced uh, Beck and Radiohead. In fact, I think to this day he still produces Radiohead. I think he's produced every Radiohead album. So the way George Martin was to the Beatles, Nigel Godley is uh, the... No, sorry, Nigel Godrich, not Godley. Don't know where I've got that from. Uh, Nigel Godrich was the equivalent to George Martin for Radiohead. Uh, anyway, when Paul originally asked uh, Godrich to help him uh, produce this album, he was initially quite scared, quite worried at the thought of, oh my God, this is Paul McCartney. Uh, and, you know, he's a legend. But he was also worried that Paul wouldn't want to work the way that Nigel likes to work, uh, which I'll get on to in a minute. So, in fact, I'll get on to it now. So, Godrich, he wasn't afraid to tell Paul when something was crap, which not many people have the balls to do. It's only really been John Lennon and 
George Martin really that could get away with telling Paul when something was crap. Um, most producers and I know I said that Egypt Station, New Memory, Almost Full, etc. The albums that all come after this are good albums, but one of the problems I have with New, which I haven't reviewed yet, and Egypt Station, which I have reviewed, is the producers on them. I get a feeling they're a bit scared to tell Paul the truth. For example, on Egypt Station, the track "Fuck You," which was produced by Ryan Tedder. <laughs> Ryan Tedder obviously hasn't got the spine. Maybe I'm wrong here. To tell Paul that it's a crap song because Paul now is of course Sir Paul McCartney and you can't criticise a knight of the realm, this is a legend, you can't criticise one of the Beatles, this is the greatest songwriter of all time, the most successful songwriter of all time, how can you possibly criticise him when he's writing songs? Nigel wasn't afraid to criticise Paul and it obviously been a while since someone had had the balls to criticise Paul because or someone close to Paul working with him and had the balls to criticise him because Paul wasn't very happy about this at first. He was taken aback and the pair were initially clashing quite a lot during the sessions for this album. And apparently at one point Paul got very, very close to sacking him before realising that the reason he worked with Nigel was for exactly what he was doing, to push Paul. You know, Nigel wasn't slagging Paul off his songs off just for the sake of it just to put Paul down it was to get the absolute best out of him and the fact he's done this we should all be grateful for because it's why this album is so good he's not let the crap like foot you get through he's pushed and pushed and pushed Paul to do what he's capable of good work uh, now initially when they began recording this album in September 2003 Paul brought along his entire band uh, this is his touring band that was relatively new at this point, but he's still with them to this day. It was uh, Brian and Rusty and Wicks and Abe. And they played two, they did a couple of takes, I think, of uh, Follow Me and This Never Happened to Me, I think was the two songs they did. And almost instantly, after maybe two or three takes, Nigel said to Paul, Nah, I wanted to work with just you. Just so you effectively told Paul's band, on your bike, go away. I don't want you here. So Paul ended up playing virtually every instrument on this album. And for a very long time, a lot of people refer to this album as McCartney 3. Obviously, McCartney 3 has since happened. But I don't think this was ever like the McCartney albums because it is more heavily produced. It has got strings and stuff on it, and it's not just Paul. But it is in the same vein of the McCartney albums and the fact that Paul plays all the instruments. All the you know virtually all the guitars all the drums all the bass etc piano is all from him obviously the strings haven't come from him but yeah it just goes to show his talent uh so i think that's all in terms of the recording i've got to say but like i said this is a very personal album for paul it's not something he's done very often if at all before this uh, he's maybe done the odd tune here and there something like here today but in terms of a whole album and stuff like that never uh, but at this point in his life, Paul was going through quite a turbulent period, uh, especially during his sessions because it was sort of early on in the session when they first started, his marriage to the delightful Heather Mills was sort of just new. It was just getting going. As this album was wrapping up towards the end, it was falling apart. So it's kind of a bit all over the place, this album. You've got Paul, in some senses, quite happy. And then you've got other bits where he seems quite down in the dumps. Which is probably because his marriage was breaking down. Plus, I don't think at this point he probably fully gotten over Linda. I imagine he was still grieving Linda. So that probably uh, gets itself into the theme why Paul sounds sad in places. And I'm not 100% sure, but I can't remember if during the time he was married to Heather... If he had quite, with not all of his kids, but quite a difficult relationship with some of them, I think him and James, his only son, uh, fell out while he was married to Heather and they didn't have any contact. So I imagine that'll have been playing on his mind as well. So yeah, it was definitely a tricky period in Paul's life. Probably one of the trickiest periods he'll ever have been through. And to be fair, the guy has been through quite a lot of trauma when you think about it. Uh, and yet he's still carrying on making great music.
Anyway, the artwork, this photo of Paul is obviously not from 2005. This is from 1962. It's quite a famous photo taken by his brother, Mike McCartney. And the title of this is, it's a proper northern name, this. Uh, the photo is called Our Kid Through Mum's Neck Curtains. I love that. Uh, yeah, it's a great photo of Paul. This is just before, I would say, Beatles took off. It's probably not long before they first released Love Me Do, but it's just very intimate. It's just him in his back. But it'd say backyard, I'd call that more of a back garden to be honest, uh, playing his acoustic guitar. Obviously unaware that this photo was being taken by Mike. Yeah, great photo, really works well as, the, as an album cover. Uh, there was three singles released from this album, Fine Line, Jenny Wren and uh, This Never Happened Before, but I think This Never Happened Before was only a single in America, maybe, I might be wrong. But in terms of the singles here in the UK, Fine Line reached number 20 in the charts and Jenny Wren reached number 22, which is pretty good going. You know, Paul in 2005 is still getting songs in the top 40. Obviously, if in the 70s, he was getting them in the top five, number one most of the time. But, you know, that, that long, well, say not that long ago, it's 20 years ago nearly now, but he was still getting in the singles charts. So don't, these might be some of the last singles he actually got in the singles charts. Anyway, uh, to promote this album, Paul held a concert at Abbey Road called Chaos and Creation at Abbey Road. It was on YouTube for a very long time. I assume it's still there. Uh, if you can, I highly recommend watching it. He plays a lot of the songs from this album live. He plays Beatles songs live, I think, as well, if I remember right. Uh, very good concert, that. Yeah, if, you can, if you've never seen it, search for it on YouTube. Chaos and Creation at Abbey Road. Great thing. Um... Also in support of this tour, Paul embarked on a tour of the US and Canada. <laughs> There's a surprise. Um, the album itself, it reached number 10 here in the UK, which seems quite low, but <laughs> Driving Rain, for some reason, failed to get in the top 40. I think Driving Rain got to like 46 or 47, which is a flop for Paul. Um, so this one is he's, he's improving. He's back at number 10. Um... Yeah, it's probably one of his lower charting albums, this, which is a shame, because it deserves number one, really. Uh, over in the US, it got to number six. Um, yeah. I think the tour in America probably helped it get a bit higher over there. Uh, critically, this album was very well received by the critics, and it was considered surprising to a lot of them because it was very intimate and reflective, which is unusual for Paul. Uh, and it was obviously very well received because the album was nominated for at the Grammys for Album of the Year. I think it was also I think Nigel got himself Nigel Godrich got himself nominated for Producer of the Year. Yeah, I think Paul even got nominated for Best Pop Vocals, Male Pop Vocals or something. Didn't win any of these, but it was nominated. Um, obviously, this was the first album Paul released uh, after turning sixty, so he was now in his sixties. And his voice, yeah, all right, apart, it is now starting to show its age. It's not quite to the point where I think if you listen to certain tracks of more recent albums, like McCartney 3, uh, I don't really think there's anything on this album where you would think, oh, God, he's struggling to sing that. There's just a few occasions where you'll think, oh, if he was a little younger, he'd probably hit that note a bit better. But I wouldn't argue he can't sing on this album, put it that way. Not that I would say he can't sing now. I'm digging a hole here. So we're going to go into the track-by-track track review of this wonderful piece of music. Uh, right, it opens with the opening track, then the lead single, Fine Line. Not that one, by Harry Styles. This was the one first. Um, this song is about the only rocker on the album. If you are a fan of rockers, this isn't the album for you, because this is about all you're getting. There's maybe a song later on in the album, which I'll come to, which you could also class as a rocker. But, yeah, this one is about... The only definite rocker. But I love this song. It's fun. And this album, for the most part, is a se quite serious album. So this is a welcome little bit of fun. Uh, the harmonies on this are very good, especially on the Come On, uh, what is it? Come, Come Home, Brother, All Is Forgiven, We All Cry When You Were Driven Away. That bit when Paul's harmonising with himself. Brilliant. Guys, yeah. It's a piano driven tune as well. Uh, the piano does seem to drive quite a lot of the songs on this album, actually. Yeah, um, Paul is just very good at this sort of song. He always has been. 
technically this is the title track because it includes the lyric chaos and creation i think it, the lyric is there is a long way between chaos and creation if you don't say which one of these you're going to choose i think that's the lyric so that is technically meaning this is the title track the strings as well, this song has strings on it which are very striking, they're very jarring, it's kind of Eleanor Rigby sort of style of strings. Um, yeah, that sort of slasher, shower scene sort of thing, very striking, that sort of thing. Uh, Paul plays virtually every instrument on this track as well, which, you know, what a talent, we knew that already, but what a talent. Anyway, if you've enjoyed that upbeat rocker, that, that's it, now it's time to chill out and enjoy the downbeat stuff uh like the second track here how kind of you which is a complete tone change very very moody song um apparently nigel godrich inspired paul to add piano loops to this song which i'm pleased he did because the piano loops kind of make this song in some ways now i've wrote here that this seems to be a love song but it also has a it also sounds a bit sarcastic it's maybe just me misunderstanding this and i think paula said this is about heather and how she helped him through uh linda's death and whatever but although i don't think he was fully over it by this point um but because obviously by the time this album came out the marriage it hadn't i don't think it had quite broken up at this point but it was heading that way the way paul started singing it to me it's just always sound like he's being a bit sarky like it's maybe just me that thinks this, but the way he's sort of, just the way he sings, how kind of you. Like, how kind are you? It's maybe just me that thinks like this. Anyway, like I say, this is a slower song, but it works well like that. Um, I'm not sure when these songs were originally written, if Paul intended for them all to be quite faster, and it was Nigel that wanted them slowed down, but thank you, Nigel, if that was you that slowed them down, because this song, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Uh, I love this song. I just love the tone of it, the fact that it's not really like anything, that this is going to be a common trend in this review, it's not like anything else Paul has ever really done this song. Uh, and again, Paul plays virtually every instrument on this track, what a talent. Right, track three, Jenny Wren, the quite famous Jenny Wren actually, it's probably the most famous song on this album. Uh, apparently it's written about a character of the same name in a Charles Dickens 1865 novel called Our Mutual Friend. Uh, I've never read the novel, I've never even heard of it actually, but uh, yeah, apparently that's where the name comes from. So in terms of the song itself, the style of it is very similar to Blackbird and Calico Skies in the way that Paul is playing the finger picking style on an acoustic guitar. Uh, I'm not saying it's in the league of those songs, although some people will argue it is. Uh, it is also the first song in pop music history to feature a Duduk, I think is how you pronounce it, which plays a little solo in the middle. It's a wooden sort of uh, wind instrument, which I don't know how often it's been used since, but this is the first time it's ever used. And it's quite nice, actually. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people consider this a modern day McCartney classic. Um, I'm sure I watched a video from Justin Hawkins, who's in, oh God, I forgot what band he's in. He's now become a YouTuber, Justin Hawkins, uh, where he's on about McCartney songs and his favourite McCartney songs, and most of them are from like the 60s and the 70s, and then he goes complete left field and picks this song. So, yeah, it's obviously uh, got quite a bit of a cult following, this song. Um, a wren itself is apparently one of Paul's favourite birds, <laughs> the wing type. Uh, <laughs> It's a simple song, this, but it's brilliant. It's one of those just simple Paul McCartney songs. It's just him literally finger-picking on an acoustic guitar uh, with a little bit of percussion and things, but it's just a beautifully simple song. I like Jenny Wren. Good song. Right, track four, At The Mercy. I've never been massively into this song. I've never massively cared for it, if I'm honest. Uh, again, it's very moody. It's kind of in the same style of um, How Kind Are You. The strings on this song, they're nice, but they're not quite as striking as on Fine Line. I like the chorus and the way the Paul sings the At the mercy, at the mercy. But yeah, uh, not really a lot to say about this song. It's alright, but it's not one of the best on the album. Alright, the next track, track five, Friends to Go, which is a contender for the best on the album. 
Uh, now, according to Paul, this song was inspired by, and he dedicates it to, George Harrison. This album, of course, is the first album that Paul released after George Harrison's passing. If I remember right, Driving Rain came out maybe a week or two, I think a week or two before George passed away. So this is his first song, album since George passed. It's not like a song like Here Today where it's written specifically about George. It's just the sound of it sounds very Harrison-like. Uh, I could hear George singing this song, actually. And because of that, it, what, for whatever reason, Paul is doing very sort of Beatles-style harmonies, which he doesn't do that often. Um, but when he does them, it's, they're great. Like, the harmonies on this song are wonderful. It sounds like George should be singing the lead and Paul's doing the backing and the harmonies. Yeah, like I say, contender for best on the album. Um, I love the line, you never need to worry about me, I'll be fine on my own. Someone else can worry about me, I've spent a lot of time on my own. What a great line that is for a great song. Uh, Paul plays everything on this song, there are no other musicians on this one, it's just Paul on his own. Most tracks on this album do feature maybe Nigel playing some things, with Paul playing the vast amount of the instruments, but on this one it is purely just Paul. And had he been alive, I think George Harrison would have liked this song. Uh, it's a good length as well. It's only about two and a half minutes, which is a good length for a song like this. It, it's not too short, but it's not too long. It's just the perfect length. Uh, yeah, good song, friends to go. Like I say, contender for my favourite on the album. Right, track six, English Tea. This is the first time in a very long time, I think, that Paul has done something that could be classed as his granny music, as I think Ringo used to call it. It's kind of in the style of when I'm 64 or you gave me the answer, things like that. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but this song, it just really annoys me. Yeah, it's just like, I don't know. I don't know if it's because I'm English myself. I, it just annoys me. I, I just, I don't know. Uh, it's a short song, which I'm pleased about. It's only about two minutes, if that. Uh, if it was any longer, I'd probably skip this one, to be honest. Production on it is very good though, and the actual sound of it, I'm assuming this is what they're going for, it sounds very much like the aristocracy. Uh, yeah. Definitely so far the worst song on the album. I don't really like English Tea, like I say, it annoys me. Uh, but after that we have Too Much Rain, which is a great song with great lyrics. It redeems itself, it picks back up in its quality a bit. Uh, this one, it sounds very much like a personal song to Paul. You know, he's singing stuff like... In this life is too much. I can't remember the lyrics off the top of my head. Um, ah, one of them is "You've got to learn to laugh," which I think is a great lyric. It's like, yeah, you do have to learn to laugh. Um, and it's sing stuff like "Smile." It's, it's just basically reminding you to enjoy yourself, smile and laugh, and stuff like that. Um, a lot of people really rate this song and consider it a later day McCartney classic. It's never been one of my favourites on the album. It's a great song, but I don't think it's one of the best on the album. But yeah, um, when singing it as well, when singing the line Too Much Rain, Paul goes for a high note and he just about hits it. So his voice is still hanging in there. I don't think he would be able to hit it now. Uh, but yeah, at this point he could just hit it and he sounds good singing it. Right, after that, track eight, A Certain Softness. Very romantic sounding song this. It's probably one of the more romantic songs on the album. Uh, part of that is due to its musicianship. It sounds very sort of like Greek or Italian, that sort of style of instrumentation. Paul even goes for a falsetto in places here and he manages it, which, you know, I know he's done it on things like The Kiss of Venus on McCartney 3, which I think he does it all right on that, to be honest. But, yeah, I think on here he does it very well. Um, the musicianship as well, it makes the song sound a bit mysterious, just in its style, that sort of, like, romantic mystery. Yeah. Anyway, track nine, Riding to Vanity Fair. Here we go. This is when the album really, really comes into its own. This song, I love it. This is a contender for my favorite on the album. This and Friends To Go, in my opinion, are the two best tracks on this album. This song is very dark and it is very moody. Apparently when um, Paul first played this to Nigel Godrich, he didn't like it. He liked the line, a bit, the opening line, a bit my tongue. And that was all he liked about it. So for a while they just sort of neglected the song. They didn't care about it. And then I think late on in the sessions they returned to it. And they both loved it. And yeah, they, I think they slowed it down as well. Which completely takes this song to a whole new place. I think originally this song was quite a fast one. 
but Nigel, I assume, convinced Paul to slow it down. And thank God he did. Um, because, yeah, this song it is one of the most moody songs, one of the darkest songs I think Paul McCartney has ever done. And the big question is, who is it about? Naturally, people will assume it's about Heather Mills, which, at the time, Paul denied, which... You know, at this point, he's still married to it. He's about to go through a divorce proceeding with her. He's not going to come out and say, I am writing songs like this about uh, my wife, about my ex-wife. So I'm not saying it isn't about her. She maybe did inspire it, just Paul's never publicly admitted to it. But apparently he has said it's about, uh, I think it was his manager who he'd just split with at this time. He'd worked, been Paul's manager for a while. And I think it was his manager, it was maybe his publicist. It was someone who worked quite close with him anyway. And they be and they got themselves involved in a biography uh about uh Paul. And apparently this fellow was uh, revealing quite personal secrets about Paul that Paul didn't want in the public domain. So Paul felt absolutely betrayed and sacked him and apparently this song's about him. You know, that's the trouble with friendship to with friendship to someone figure it out it has to be real uh yeah my mind's gone blank to what the lyrics are now uh the strings on this song as well they elevate it to another level this song i don't think it would be quite as good as it is without the strings they sound very moody very dark very good uh there's not many songs that paul has ever done that sound like this and i think if john lennon had been alive he would love this song i think he if john lennon was alive he'd be saying this was one of paul's best songs because it sounds very lennon-esque in places of its production i love the way paul sings it as well he sounds annoyed he sounds like he means what he's singing uh it's also the longest song on the album which is good i like it when songs when albums have like one song that's over five minutes i hate it when other whole album songs that are that length but when you get one song that length and it's a really good song it's brilliant uh yeah i don't think this song would work either if it was shorter i think it's his length that really gets it the point across and hammers the message home about how annoyed Paul is. Uh, he didn't seem to have any to spare while you were riding to Vanity Fair. Great song. Uh, yeah, highlight of the album. Uh, anyway, track 10 is Follow Me. This was the only song on the album that features Paul's band. I think this was the first thing they recorded, which is why his band are on it. Uh, I love the way the song kind of builds up and then when the strings kick in, the tone completely changes and the speed picks up. Yeah. It's a nice song, but it's not one of my favourites. Not really got a lot to say about it, to be honest. Anyway, track 11, Promise to Your Girl. This starts off as a kind of slow piano ballad where Paul's singing about looking through the backyard of his life. Then suddenly it goes into one of those really, really, really annoying Queen-like harmony vocals. You know the sort of thing, like Bohemian Rhapsody or Somebody to Love, those opera-style really, really shit annoying style of harmonies he does that and it's like no paul please don't do that don't do that you sound like queen uh but then after he shuts up doing that he goes into a sort of rocker it's about as close as we get to another rocker on the album it's kind of in the style of lady madonna in some ways um yeah it's it's upbeat which is kind of a bit welcome after quite a few downtrodden songs we get a more upbeat one uh, it's not one of my favourites on the album, but it's at least fun. And we do like fun. Paul plays every instrument on this one as well. Get on you, Paul. Uh, right, track 12, This Never Happened Before. It's got a drum machine. I don't know if this is the first time Paul's used a drum machine. Normally, you'd have a proper drummer. But he has got a drum machine. Uh, the strings on this song, they are absolutely beautiful. And it's a love song. It's just a great, great McCartney, typical love song. Yeah, really like this never happened before and apparently at some point just before this album came out Paul was getting a massage and the girl giving him the massage uh, for whatever reason Paul decided to play her this song and she loved it that much she wanted it at a wedding and it hadn't been released at this point so Paul gave her a tape on the condition that she played it at the wedding and then gave it straight back to him which she did which I think is a lovely story and yeah it would be it would be great at a wedding this song and had this song come out in the 60s or the 70s, I think this would be classed as a McCartney classic. And a lot of people would be playing this at weddings because it's just it's just a really nice romantic love song. Really good. Really like this song. And then track 13, we have the closing track, Anyway, which 
<laughs> I always forget this song exists. I always think um, this never happened before as the closing track on this album. And then this kicks in and I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, anyway, this is a typical McCartney piano ballad. It's what he's famous for, this sort of thing. It's a great closing track to the album. The instrumentation's fab. The vocals are great. There's not really a lot to say about this song. I just think it's a good tune. But anyway, uh, that is Chaos and Creation in the Backyard. Is it one of Paul's best albums? Yeah, I would say so. I don't think it's his best ever. Um, of his latter-day efforts, it's definitely one of the better ones. And that's saying something because his latter-day efforts have all been pretty solid. But I think this is probably the best of his latter-day efforts. And he has been on a streak ever since this album of great albums. But yeah, it is definitely the most personal album he's ever done. You can tell in places he's annoyed, he's hurting at this point in his life. And if you've never heard this album, I highly recommend listening to especially Friends To Go and Riding To Vanity Fair. I mean, Riding To Vanity Fair, I've listened to that song a lot recently because there's people in my life who I could um, dedicate that song to. But anyway, uh, for now, that is all I've got to say, I think, about this album. So, yeah, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the future, hopefully. Bye for now.